And what we're going over is this beautiful, marvelous, eternal story of Christ and the provisions of his salvation for us in his death and his resurrection. We trust that God will enrich your hearts this morning, even though much of the story is familiar to you, and for some it might not be as familiar, but I pray that it will be moving in the power to bring you closer to Jesus Christ. But all of us certainly need to know how better to communicate Jesus Christ, and we need to know how to understand the scriptures which God has given to us. So as we come again to Peter's sermon, we're talking and we're taking this in several parts. We come this morning to the part of the sermon that is the main theme, stretching from verses 22 through 36. And within, and within the context that's majoring particularly on verses 30, or pardon me, verse 24 and following, dealing with the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. Now the resurrection of Jesus Christ as well known to all of us, is the cornerstone of Christianity. It is mentioned at least 104 times in the New Testament, and it is, without question, the most profound and permanent point in biblical history and in all redemptive history. With the apostolic company, for an example, after the apostate and the suicide of Judas, the apostles met for the purpose of selecting one to complete their number to 12 again. And in the process of their selection, the statement was made, the statement was made that the reason for which one was to be chosen was that it might be a witness to us of the resurrection. That became the chief thing. The great issue is the proclamation of Jesus Christ and that he was alive. That's what sets him, Jesus, apart from every other religious leader who ever existed. He came out of the grave alive. Mm -hmm. The crucifixion loses its meaning without the resurrection. As we well know, the resurrection becomes in Scripture the crowning proof, not only of Jesus' deity, but the guarantee of our own resurrection. And if you remove the resurrection, then the death of Christ is a heroic death of a noble martyr, or it's the pathetic death of a deranged man, or it's the execution of a fraud. It can't be anything more without the resurrection. And so we will conclude then, then it's not primarily Jesus' teachings, it's not primarily his miracles, it's not even primarily his dying that is key. It is primarily his rising again. Unless Jesus Christ has risen, there will be no church. At the death of Christ, the disciples were scattered like shaft in the breeze. And they were regathered when he arose from the grave and the church was born. And this becomes the cornerstone of all great apostolic preaching. And it yet should be the lifeline of Christianity today. When the Jews, for example, in Acts 27, or 26 rather, caught Paul in the temple and attempted to kill him, the Bible says that he received help from God and preached unto them the resurrection. And in Acts chapter 17, when Paul was preaching to the Greek philosophers on Mars Hill, the subject of his sermon was the resurrection. And when the disciples and the apostles were filled with the Spirit of God, some days after Pentecost, the Bible says that with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And the resurrection was the key to Peter's great sermon in our text. He spends one verse, verse 22, on the life of Christ. One verse, verse 23, on the death of Christ. And then he spends verses 24 through 32 on the resurrection of Christ. This takes the overwhelming portion of his sermon. Now, we've already begun to study Peter's sermon in our last week's lesson. And we're studying it rather slowly because we want to get everything out of it that's there. Because it sets so many precedents for us in terms of ministry, in terms of preaching patterning. 
We learn to begin with that the Holy Spirit of God is the agent that set the stage for the sermon. That all of the events of the day of Pentecost were one big living illustration to grab everybody's attention. It was on Pentecost, you remember, 50 days after Passover. The city is now jammed with hundreds of thousands of Jews. Both those who lived there and those who were pilgrims from other lands. They were there to celebrate the feast. And the Spirit of God came, the scripture says, with a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And that sound gathered all of the people together. The Spirit of God baptized the believers at that time into the body of Christ. It indwelt every one of them and filled them with power. They spoke the wonderful works of God in languages that they had not previously studied. And the people were brought together and confounded by all of this, and they heard them speak of the wonderful works of God, their own God, Jehovah God. And they were confused because they believed that these people were followers of one who was a blasphemer. And they believed that they were satanic, but they couldn't figure out if they were satanic, then why were they announcing then the wonderful works of God? And it is at this point that the Holy Spirit have, having provided a living illustration that Peter stands up in verse 14 and he begins to preach. And the, and the first of his sermon is his introduction. And his introduction, he explains Pentecost. He shows them what's been going on, and in effect, he simply says, what you have seen is the sign that the age of the Messiah has begun. And he says simply in verse 17 that it came to pass in these last days. He's quoting, as we learned last week, out of the book of Joel. Saith God, I will pour out my spirit. And what Peter is saying is what you've been saying or what you have seen is the beginning of the outpouring of the Spirit of God which is to announce the birth of the Messianic age. It is the last days, he says. Did you not know that the Jewish last days have been going on for some 2,000 years now? The whole age of Messiah is called the last days. And we saw that in the Old Testament that the Old Testament saints saw no parenthesis. They saw no church age in the middle. They just saw the coming of the Messiah and the kingdom. And once the Messiah came, then the last days would begin. And so Peter says it's the beginning of the last days. This was what we call the prefilment of what will ultimately fulfill, be fulfilled in the tribulation and the kingdom which is to come where all prophecy will be fulfilled. All prophecy down to verse number 20 will be fulfilled. And all those wonderful signs that we saw in the earth and in the heavens and the miracles that's indicated in verses 17 and 18. And so he's saying you've seen the beginning. You've gotten the beginning taste of the messianic times. The Messiah has arrived. And he says, in view of that fact, verse 21, it's time to call upon him and get saved. Now, that may not make any, that may not be a big deal to us, but it was to the Jewish audience. The Jewish audience from the time of Moses had been waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah would become as the king, the reign over all. The Messiah would be the sovereign one. And they were religiously looking for the Messiah. And so Peter begins in his introduction by explaining that Pentecost is proof positive that the Spirit of God is poured out, which means that the Messianic age has come. The Messiah for which the Jews had prayed and longed for for years and for centuries had finally arrived. Now, if there is a Messiah or if there is a Messianic age, then there got to be a Messiah. 
And that's what exactly Peter wants them to know. And so he now says that I have explained and talked about the Messianic times, but now let me talk to you a moment about the Messiah himself. And he moves from his introduction to the second point, which is the theme or the main body of his sermon. And it is at this time he spends the majority of his time exalting Jesus. His introduction simply explained why Pentecost, his theme is going to exalt Jesus. And he announces to them the, this outstanding, overwhelming fact that this Jesus of Nazareth, whom they had despised and mocked and looked down on, is none other than God's chosen and approved and accredited Messiah. And this stands not only, my friends, this morning as a point of information, but this is a fantastic indictment upon his audience at that time. Why? Because they had just crucified then their own Messiah using the hands of the Romans. All right, let's look for a moment. And I want to review a little bit about what we went over last week. Let's review how this thing pans out. How Peter presents the facts that Jesus is the Messiah. First of all, he talks about the life of Jesus in verse 22. He uses the words, ye men of Israel. Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. And he uses their terms to describe Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. Notice, a man approved or proclaimed, proven, openly declared by God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs. Now, get the difference. Please note the difference between a miracle, a wonder, and a sign. Let me just briefly mention this in case we have forgotten. A miracle is a mighty deed, something that was done by the supernatural force and power of God. And then there was the wonder of the miracle that was done. And then the sign always pointed to the reason that the miracle was done. There was the miracle that was the mighty, that was the working of the mighty wondrous power of God. Then there was the wonder of it all, it the, the awesomeness of it all. And then there was the sign. The miracle always pointed to a sign. And if you read and study Jesus' miracles, after every miracle, there would be a lesson. Sometimes the lesson would come before the miracle. Sometimes the lesson would come in the middle. And sometimes the lesson would come at the end. Jesus did mighty deeds which produced wondrous effects for the purpose of acting as a sign pointing to a spiritual truth. Jesus never did a miracle just to be doing something. He never did a miracle just as a means of an end. He would do a miracle to be pointing to a lesson, to point to a truth, and they would be in a wonder. They would be in, in an amazement. They would be in awe of what they had just seen because it was not the norm. It was produced by a supernatural power, and Jesus would then teach. And Jesus' miracles never uh, 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 was an end in themselves. They were to create a wonderment that brought men to a spiritual truth. And so God, through Jesus, approved his messianic character in ministry. He accredited Jesus as the Messiah. How? How did God show his approval on Jesus? How did God prove that Jesus was the Messiah? Well, by miracles, by wonders, and by signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as the scripture says, as ye yourselves also know. And he even, in the, he in, even indicts them because they knew that God was working through him. You remember Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night? The remember, the member of the Sanhedrin court in John chapter 3? And what he said of Jesus, we know that no man can do these things except you. What? Be God be with you? They knew that he was doing things that were divine. Even the high priest and his cohorts had to admit that Jesus was doing miracles. And that's what upset them so much. 
There was no question about the miraculous nature of Jesus. Many of the people had even eaten the things that he had produced out of his own hands. They had seen him heal time and time again. And so God had accredited Jesus Christ and the view of the whole world and had established the fact that by every miracle that he was none other than the Messiah. The life of Jesus was living proof and a living proclamation that by God himself that Jesus was the Messiah. God authenticated Jesus as Lord and Savior first of all by the miracles. By the miracles. And every time we experience something that we call a miracle in our life, it should once again authenticate the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen. Every time something supernatural happens in our life by the divine power of God, we should rejoice because God once again is proving to us that Jesus was the Messiah. Yes. Yes. And then we move on to point two uh, in verse 23. And Paul, that Peter rather, is going to talk about his death as being a another indication of his messiahship. You know what it says in verse 23, him that is referring to Jesus of Nazareth being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken him by wicked hands and have crucified and slain. In other words, here you have two sides of a divine paradox. Absolute sovereignty and human responsibility. They had by their own act of will, their own evil nature, crucified Jesus Christ using Roman hands to do it, but they had not done this to shock Jesus. Jesus was no victim. He knew what was happening. It had all been planned out. It had all been been predetermined by the counsel and foreknowledge of God, which means that this was already ordained. It was ordained of whom? By God. And when you want to study this even further, study the 19th chapter of, of the Gospel of John and the crucifixion. And everything that happened to Jesus during his crucifixion was a fulfillment of prophecy that had been spoken concerning Jesus centuries before this time. And so, it is by the determined counsel and the foreordained knowledge of God that made all of this happen. And yet, that doesn't take away from the guilt of those who killed him. Although God knew it, it does not take away the guilt of the Roman soldiers who killed him. Because they did it of their own free will. So, Jesus is seen to be the Messiah by the life that he lived as God proved him as doing miracles through him, and Jesus is seen to be the Messiah by the death, or the kind of death that he died, in that his death had been prophesied centuries before he actually died, and he fulfilled every prophecy even to the end. How that God was accrediting him by him fulfilling everything and the counsel of God is what this message is all about. They had the Messiah with them and they did not want to accept the fact that this Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. Thirdly, we come to our major point of study this morning to the point Peter says he is accredited with God. How? Through the resurrection. And this begins in verse 24. If the Messiah's sufferings were ordained by the foreknowledge of God, then so was his resurrection. Now watch this in verse 24. Whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Now, we see God getting involved again. It's God who did the miracles. It's God who set the plan in order in verse 23. It's God who raised him up in verse 24. And this theme is repeated several times. Several times. It's God in verse 33 who exalts him. It's God in verse 36 
who declares that he, that he is the Lord. It's God doing the whole thing. Jesus never came on a humanitarian mission. He never functioned out of his own desire or his own designs. Jesus was on a divine schedule, pre-planned event by the God of the universe and God himself. Jesus was simply activating a plan that had been made by God. Jesus was there, but God raised him up. I want you to see that. Jesus was dead, but God raised him up. The greatest accreditation that Jesus is the Messiah is in the fact of his resurrection. And this becomes the major theme of this apostolic teaching and preaching. Now, although, and I want you to catch this point, it's very important, all through this particular sermon, there is a dichotomy implied between the Jews, or should I say the Jews, and those who thought they were believing Jews, because they constantly felt that they were uh, uh, God's chosen simply because of their past. But watch this, catch this thought here, and unfortunately there is a division between verse 23 and 24, where the flow really gives us this dichotomy. Watch this. Then, as we read the end of verse 23, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God has raised up. Now, hopefully I want you to see the contrast. You killed him, but God raised him. Now, this becomes a reoccurring theme throughout the apostolic preachings in the book of Acts. For example, in chapter 3, Peter preaching again in verse 14. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. Now watch, here he comes. And kill the Prince of Life. Here it is. Whom God raised up from the dead. Do you see it? Yeah. He sets the Jews at opposite ends of the world from God. Now this is very important. This is one of the most important points of evangelism. Now get this, get this. Because we're living in a time when those who talk about Christ and, and proclaim Christ, there is no dichotomy in their message. They want to put everybody on the same plane. God loves everybody regardless of what, and he wants everybody to be happy. But as Peter preaching, there is a dichotomy. There are those who are against Jesus, who are against God, but God raised Jesus. God raised him up. And we must begin to set the record straight that those who have not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior is not a part of the world that God governs. They must know that they are rebels against God. You remember once again, Nicodemus comes to Jesus, who was a pretty good guy. If anybody was goody good, it was him. He was self-righteous. And he had a prominent place in the Sanhedrin court. He may have been the number one teacher in Israel at that day. Now, you might have expected Jesus to say something nice. Well, Nicodemus, you are a really sharp guy. You're pretty sharp. And I know you are moral and you do a lot of wonderful things for the community and for the society. But if you just did one little thing, you'd be just a little bit more complete. But Jesus says, Nicodemus, you know you have a problem. And your problem is you've got to be born again. In other words, he got to have Nicodemus realize that you are not at the same level where God is. And the further you go in self-righteousness, the further you're going to be going apart from God. And so what does Peter do? He really separates those Jews who are thinking that they're right with God because of their self-righteousness. He's separating them from the God of Scripture. He said, you can him, but God raised him. Now this occurs again in chapter 10 and in this case dealing with the Gentiles, chapter 10 of Acts verse 39, the scripture says, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree, him God raised. 
Here you see the dichotomy again. And over again, chapter 13, verse 29. And I like the thing here. He said, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the sculpture. And God raised him up from the dead. You see the disparity. You killed him, but God raised him. Now that is to show them that they are on the other side of God. You are not as close to God as you think you are because of your heritage. You are not who you think you are because of your history. You are far apart from God. You killed Jesus, but God raised him up. He's always showing the disparity between who they thought they were and who they really were. The Jews prided themselves of being a part of God's family. And the, and the epistles of the New Testament is always trying to show the Jews where they really are. We see this again in Romans chapter 2 as we deal with the knowledge of God. In Romans chapter 2, I want to read just a couple of verses here beginning at verse 17. The word of God says in Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Romans chapter 2, verse number 17. But if thou art called a Jew, and here's a classic definition of a religious Jew. If thou art called a Jew, now here's what you do. Resistance in the law. Now that was characteristic of a Jew, was that he put his boast in the law. He put his boast that he was close to God because he kept the law. He put, he put his confidence in him knowing what the law was. And he would keep the law. That was his argument. And the Jews would keep on and keep on, keep on, thinking that they were all right because they kept a certain amount of holes. And then catch this in verse 17. And maketh thy boast of God. Verse 18. And knoweth his will. The Jews always thought that he knew God and knew God's will. And Peter starts out by, drag, by driving this wedge between the Jew and God and saying, you don't really know God at all. You really don't know his will. You killed him, but God raised him. You don't know really who you are. You think you are special because you have the law given to you, but you don't keep it and you don't apply it. You don't see where every man must begin. Every man must begin his journey with God at the same place. Every man must begin by realizing I'm far from God. That's the point that we have to begin. When you're telling somebody about Jesus, it's not about their good works. It's not about how many times they go to church. They got to understand that they were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And because of the sins of Adam in Genesis chapter 3, they are on one spectrum and God is on another. And the only way to get to God is by the way of Jesus Christ. Only in Jesus Christ can a man be reconciled to God. You cannot be reconciled to God by your works. You cannot be reconciled to God by the money that you give, by the good deeds that you do, by how you work in the community. You must have faith in the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. I wish I had a couple people that just get excited about talking about Jesus. I ain't talking about your health, your wealth, and what you're going to get. I just want to preach the sermon that Peter preached here. And the only thing he's talking about is Jesus. Somebody say amen. Amen. Once again, we have another example in John chapter 8. This is a very familiar passage and one that gives us a good illustration of this. John chapter 8, Jesus was in a dialogue. He's having a conversation with the Pharisees, these religious leaders. And this was common to the Gospel of John. That seems to be the title that John reserves to give to his people, these religious, this term, the Jews. In the eighth chapter, in verse 37, is having a little debate about the fact that they really don't know the truth. And they aren't free. And they're saying they are free. Verse 37. I know that you are of Abraham's seed. Physically, they were of Abraham's seed. But he goes on to say, you seek to kill me. Mm 
because my words has no place in you. But I speak that which I have seen with my father. In other words, you say you're Abraham's seed, and they are not only meant it physically, but spiritually. They were, they believe, his seed by faith too. And he says, what strangers, you're strangers, you claim to be Abraham's seed, but you want to kill me. If you were of Abraham's seed, you would be able to identify with the words that I see. He says, I speak that which I have seen of my father. And then watch this shot. And ye do that which ye have seen of your father. <laughs> now there's a dichotomy, another dichotomy here. Yes, yes. Jesus didn't mind putting it where it was. See, we want to love everybody in the same boat. We want to claim everybody's Christian, everybody's saved in the church. We just want to put everybody, come on, everybody saved, get everybody benefit with God. Jesus never did that. Nor did the preachers in the New Testament. And as we study in this first sermon, this preacher Peter, he puts it right where it is. You don't come to Jesus just because you were born in a family. You don't come to Jesus just because you have a history. Just because you can trace your lineage back to Abraham. That If your wife will say, if you haven't come by way of Jesus Christ, if you have not recognized that you were born in sin and shame and iniquity, you will die and go to hell. You, all of us, children, grown folks, 10, 15, 30, 105, we must admit that we are sinners and we are apart from God. And unless we come by way of Jesus Christ, we shall not be saved. Don't fool yourself because you come to church every Sunday. Amen. Don't fool yourself because you do certain things. Mm -hmm. You think you're all right? Mm -hmm. Children got to be saved just like adults. Amen. Oh, y'all don't want to hear it. Amen. We want to get a pass through our children. No. We want them to be saved. They can live in the kind of way. No, no. If you and I got to walk the straight and narrow, if you and I got to go to straight Amen. pathway, then they got to be anybody saved. Got to walk the straight and narrow pathway. Amen. 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 Jesus says, if you really knew me, if you, if you really knew my father, then you would know me. You would never miss me. If you knew who God was, ye would know me. There was a problem of recognition. He says, but you are of your father. And then he identified him in the 47th verse of that chapter. Your father, the devil. He that is of God hears God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. And they really got upset. When you talk to a Jew even today about his, if you talk to an Orthodox Jew, a religious Jew today about his religious status, and if you tell an Orthodox Jew today that they are not of God's chosen, if they have not accepted Jesus Christ, if you mention Jesus Christ, most Orthodox Jews will become so upset with you. They are upset that Jesus would be called the Messiah because he did not meet their criteria. He did not come the way that they thought that he was supposed to come. But Jesus came as God had planned it. Amen. Now we move to the point where the, the, where the resurrection is going to be proven. He's talked about his life, right? He talked about his life in what verse? Verse 22. And what did he say about his life? He said that his life was, valid, was validated by whom? By God. And how did God validate the life of Jesus? By miracles, miracles wonders, wonders, and signs. Now don't forget the trichotomy there. The miracle was to cause the wonderment. And the wonderment was to point to a sign. The miracles were always done for a lesson. The miracles wasn't done for entertainment. Amen. The miracle wasn't done to get the people to come back. The miracles were set to stage so the people would have an ear to hear what it was that Jesus was teaching. And nothing has changed today. Miracles are not done just to get your attention. Miracles are there to get you to listen, to cause you to stop in your tracks, to recognize the wonderment of God, the amazement of God. And so you have an ear to hear what it is that you're saying. 
So Peter's on this mission to, 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 to demonstrate God's plan is to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. Now he's going to carefully, and I mean very carefully, take an Old Testament scripture, an Old Testament text, Psalm 16 in verse 8 through 11, and he's going to quote it, and then he's going to apply it. And this really is a masterpiece, the way, the way Peter handles this, this Old Testament scripture. Now watch this in verse 25. And he's going to quote the Old Testament, Psalm 16. For he says, for David, you with me? Mm -hmm. For David, and of course, he's grabbing, he's grabbing the greatest one in Jewish history. He's grabbing one that all the devout individuals knew about. Everybody who was religious knew about David. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to grab their attention. For he says, for David speaketh concerning me. David speaketh concerning me. David spoke about the Messiah? David, do you mean to tell me that David spoke about Jesus of Nazareth? Boy, that's some new stuff. Peter's bringing heavy on it. They believe Jesus of, Naz of Nazareth to be nothing but a blasphemer. This is the same Jesus who did miracles, verse 23. Who died according to the plan of God, verse 24. Who was raised according to the power of God. And the one that David spoke about. You said David spoke about him? Yes, that's what Psalm 16 is all about. And he's going to go off and, 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 and quote it. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. That's a quote. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades. Neither will thou allow thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the path to life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance or thy presence. Now, here you have one of the most interesting phenomena in prophecy. Now, now we have talked about this two times this week, and I know some of you all are going to be hearing this for the third time, but just bear, just bear along with us because it sets up the stage as we have studied Psalm 16 in quite some depth this week, this Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. But I want you to see this great, interesting passage of Scripture. Now let me begin by saying this. Frequently in the Old Testament, the prophet speaking, and he's speaking in the first person's tense, is really the voice of the Messiah. This is what we call in theological circles a Christology. <laughs> A moment where Christ himself is speaking through a human agent in the earth realm. Now, if we study the Psalms and we study them closely, we will find this again and again. You remember the example that we gave you of this in this past week's study? Psalms 22. Psalms 22 in verse 1. Well, David says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But those really wasn't the words of David. They were the words of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Speaking through this man, the words of Jesus on the cross. Very often, this is a prophetic pattern to put the first person, the words of the Messiah, right in the mouth of the prophet. So we're going to see David now, who is a king. God's going to use him now as a prophet. And you find it all through Psalms 22, and you will find it elsewhere as well. And so here in Psalm 16, David is speaking, but it's really the Messiah speaking through him. You got it? Yeah. And David was prophesying the words of the Messiah regarding his trust in God. How Jesus, the Messiah, would have trust in God as he looks on the cross. As he looked down on the cross. Now this is the scene. Jesus is on the cross. Now look at verse 25. He said, I foresaw the Lord. Now I'm back at the text in Acts chapter 2, verse 25. He says, I foresaw the Lord always where? Before my face. Here Jesus is simply saying, now remember, David is the human agent that's being used. David is the channel. 
David is the conduit that's going to mouth the words, but it's really another force, another person, another identity that's working in David to give prophecy regarding what was going to happen on the cross. And I believe this is a picture of Jesus. Amen. This is a picture of Jesus. Now, stick with me. He said in verse 25, I foresaw the Lord always before my faith. Here, what is Jesus simply saying? I just kept my eyes on God. That's what he said. I just kept my eyes on God. I was continually seeing God before my face. And you see, that's the whole key to Jesus' success. Jesus never had any problem with anything that he did. Why? Because his focus was always in the right place. You know, the thing that really follows up most Christians is that they get their attention off the Lord and they start looking at something else. That's right, that's right. They always remember Peter, me and Peter, you see Jesus walking on the water and he wants to go. And he cried, the Lord, is that you? Tell me to come. And Jesus hollered back, come on, Peter. And the story making sure, said as long as Peter kept his eye on Jesus, he was able to walk. But the moment he looked out at his circumstance and he realized in his brain, this is water. I'm walking on, and I'm not supposed to be walking on water. He began to sink. And I'm here to tell you this morning, that's what the enemy does in our life. He gets our focus off of Jesus. We focus on the bills. We focus on the pain. We focus on the problem we have with our husband. We focus on the problem that our children are bringing. We focus on the problem with our bills, with our money. And when our focus is not on Jesus, we began to sink. We began to be crowded. With all kinds of despair and worry, I'm here to encourage you the morning just to keep the focus on Jesus. Amen. Jesus kept his focus. He kept his focus on Jesus. Jesus always knew where his focus was to be. And he set his face toward God and he never moved it. And Jesus is talking here in this psalm. He's the Messiah. He's prophetically talking through the mouth of David. And he said, I just kept my gaze on God and God's plan. And whatever came, just came. Oh, I wish somebody could hear me. Thinking back, I got to keep my eyes on God. I got to keep my eyes on God's plan. I can't put my eyes on who come and who don't come. I can't put my eyes on where we at, what bills. I can't, I can't keep my eyes. I got to keep my eyes on God and God's plan. Yeah. You got to stay focused in these days. Yeah, man, man. You can't allow the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches to get your focus off of Jesus. Yeah. Teach your children to get their focus on Jesus. Jesus. Whatever came to Jesus, it just came. And then he said, look at this at the end of verse 25. Is anybody reading with me? Yeah. For he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Now, unless you know what this means, that's some good stuff. The right hand was always a sign of protection in marriage. Traditionally, you know the bridegroom stands on the right hand as the protector of the bride. A bodyguard stands at the right side protected with his shield. Over here, he holds the shield against the one he's protected, and he fights with the other arm. The right side was a sign of protection. So Jesus simply says, I have nothing to fear. I'm willing to go to the cross. Why? Because God is my protector. And I trust God, my Father. And then in verse 26, come on, come on, stay with me a little while longer. Verse 26, therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Now you say, you mean that Jesus was happy about the cross? No, no. What does Hebrews 12 and 2 says? Hebrews 12 and 2 said that Jesus went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. Sure, he wasn't glad because of the pain, but he was glad for the result. He wasn't glad for them because of the pain that he had to do, but he was glad because he could see down to the corners of time that what he did on the cross was going to enable you to be in right standing with God. Because of the result, he was happy. He kept his eyes on God. And so Jesus Christ, the Messiah, said, Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. And then there comes the indication of the resurrection. Notice what the text says. Moreover, then my flesh also shall rest in hope. 
My flesh. My flesh. The literal Greek translation of this says, My body shall pitch its tent on the ground of this called hope. Yes, yes. In other words, I simply trust God. Yes. I don't have nothing to fear. Yes. I can go right into death yes. and I can just believe God who's on my right side yes. is on the other side. He said, I'm going to face death and I'm coming out on the other end. He believed God was going to bring him through. Yes. That's what he needed in verse 27 when he said, Thou will not leave my soul in Hades. Neither will thou allow Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the path to life. Jesus said, I don't fear anything. I just trust. Yes. This is the words coming out of the mouth of David, but Jesus is really speaking. This is a messianic prophecy, and he's saying my body will commit to the grave, but I got confidence yes. that I'm coming out I got confident I'm coming out on the other end. Yes. You don't allow what's happening in this present situation and this present day dictate how you coming out. You got to see beyond today. You got to see beyond the pain. You got to see beyond the tears. You got to grow up in the Lord and know that in Christ I can do all that. Yes. 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 This ain't the sum total of me. This ain't the sum total of your life. This ain't the sum total of your ministry. The night is so cold of it. I'm coming through this. God is on his side. Why? Because I trust God. Yeah. I trust God. Yeah. Woo. I don't know about you, but this, this is a good evening today. Look at verse 28. I ain't through yet. Look at verse 28. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. This means make known the paths of life. This is talking about the resurrection. Yeah. I'm going to rise. Mm. You say David is standing there saying, I'm not going to be corrupted. I'm going, I'm going to rise. They ain't talking about David himself. They ain't talking about David. You mean that I'm David, I'm going to rise? No. Look at what he said in verse 20. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy presence. Jesus is saying, I'm going right to that grave. I'm coming out on the other side and I'm coming into your presence. And I'm going to look you face to face, God. Somebody may say, well, poor David. He had no idea. David blew it. Oh, David wasn't talking about David. That's the whole point. Peter says, watch this in verse 29. Oh, this is good. This is good in verse 29. Me and brother. Now this covers it. Let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David that is both what? Dead and buried. This goes to prove that he wasn't talking about David talking about himself. Psalm 16 was not David talking about himself because the text said that David was dead and buried. And his scepter is with us until this day. And the old indications of the time of Peter and the historic notes that his tomb was yet in Jerusalem. And no Jew had ever taught that David had been raised from the dead. David was prophesying. But he was prophesying about Jesus. David's body did see corruption. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. But the good thing about it, when Jesus rose, <laughs> David's soul was one of the souls. That had to go up into heaven with Jesus. Yeah. David's soul was one of the souls that wasn't captured by the grave. Y'all didn't talk to me. Yeah. When he said that the, the, the pains of death, the pain, God had to take the pain of death out so that Christ could experience and go through the flesh to go through it. The pain of death, the pain instead of death was taken out of death by God himself. Yeah. And David's soul was one of the souls that went from the from the bosom of Abraham in the paradise part of hell that was taken up into heaven to ever be in the bosom of Abraham with Jesus. His body saw corruption because his body went through the grave. But his soul was not a prisoner there because he was a child of God. His soul was transitioned with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Woo! Oh, let's finish this. All right, so Psalm 16. Psalm 16 is talking about the resurrection. 
of Jesus Christ. You got your outlines. Mm -hmm. Y'all looking kind of tired. Let me finish this now. <laughs> point number three. Let's get point number three. God authenticated Jesus as Lord and Christ through his resurrection. Let it be. God authenticated Jesus as Lord and Christ through his exaltation and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. All of this is God authenticating Jesus as Lord and Savior. He's proving that Jesus is the Messiah. You got that? Point number four. Now, what is the crowd's response to Peter? What is the crowd's response to Peter? How does the crowd respond? To Peter. Look at verse 37. Verse 37 in the text. Everybody should be reading the scripture. Somebody got to say amen. amen. Okay, thank you, Father. He spoke. Look at verse 37. Now, when they, who is the they? The crowd. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter, and the rest of the apostles. So now this indicates that Peter is not standing by himself. He has the other 11 with him. So now the crowd is going to respond to Peter and the apostles. Brethren, what shall we do? Now, I want to tell you something. One of the reasons why we don't have in many of our church service people crying out what must they do is because what's being preached is not the adulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. We're trying to tell people how they can get their stuff and how they can move to another level, how they can get to the third dimension in God and all this other crap. But when you begin to preach Christ and him crucified on the cross and the atonement of his, of his blood and how he has reconciled us to God, the Holy Spirit will take that word and begin to pierce people in their hearts. We've got to bring to them the unadulterated gospel. We can't be giving them a social gospel. We got to be giving them the gospel gospel, which is you were born in sin, shaken in it, but Jesus who knew no sin became sin for us and he hung down the cross, but God raised him up and when the word of God said the spirit get a hold of that, the spirit will pierce their heart and they won't ever be able to sit in our services comfortable. Amen. They won't be able to sit in our services without some type of recognition that they got sin. But they feel comfortable in our services because we don't preach the gospel. We don't want to offend people. We're not offending folks and they die and go into hell. We have been commissioned to preach the good news. And the good news is the death barrel the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anybody with me? Amen. Well, I'm just going to read and preach the scriptures. And so they said, brother, what shall we do? Now, Peter, now what, what should we do in regard to what? What should we do in regard to what you just said? You have just proven to us that Jesus is the Messiah, and you told us we killed him, but God raised him up. Now, what should we do about that? Peter responds to them. And he simply says what? Repent. Amen. And each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now that's a whole sermon by itself. I can't tackle that in 10 minutes. You already know what next week's lesson is going to be about. I got to preach to you what it means to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now I ain't talking about the apostolic faith. I'm not talking about preaching in Jesus' name only. You got to understand what Peter was saying here. Peter told them to repent yeah. and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 29, for the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, that's us, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. That's you and I. Look at somebody and say, you're talking about me now. <laughs> and with many other words, solemnly testified and kept on, kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there was added about 3,000 souls. It wasn't a four-week revival. It wasn't a seven-week revival. That one day when the power of the Holy Ghost came and he preached nothing but the gospel, God Immediately to the church. Amen. I'm here to tell you, Brother Brennan, he's the same today as he was then. Amen. God is no respected person. Amen. God can do the same. 
If you got a desire to see souls saved, yeah. oh, I wish I had a witness. Yeah. If you got a desire to see souls saved, I'm not talking about having these chairs filled up with people, Hallelujah. but if you got a desire, Hallelujah. if you got a heart desire Hallelujah. to see Hallelujah. folks saved from the pit of hell to come out of the grips of Satan Hallelujah. and come on over to God's side, if you got a desire for your children to be saved, Hallelujah. I'm talking about saved, Hallelujah. saved, Hallelujah. where there's a change in your life. If you got a desire to have your husband saved, your grandma and all your relatives saved, if you got a desire, God can save them and he can save them right away, but you got to give them and live the word. You got to preach the gospel. You got to tell them that you were born in sin. You ain't good because of your good deeds. You were born in sin and shaken in iniquity, but God died on the cross for you. I'm here to tell you, God will hear your cry. God will answer your prayer. We'll see our, we'll see our loved ones saved. But we're not preaching the gospel. Our loved ones think they're alright because they go to church. Our loved ones think they're alright because they sing in the choir or because they listen to a religious program here on television. You got to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior in your heart. This got to be a personal relationship. Not because mom and daddy make you come to church. No, 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 no. You got to accept him for yourself. And we got to preach it. We got to be consistent with it. We got to live it every single day. We got to tell everybody that we come in contact with. So the result... The crowd responded. They responded in Peter's application. Letter A. The crowd responds with conviction. They respond with conviction. When the gospel is preached, conviction will come. Yes. That's when the Holy Ghost will come and grip your heart, and pierce your heart through and through, and allow you to know you're not where you think you are. Yes. Yes. Letter B. How does Peter apply this message? Well, number one, he says, repair. It means a, a, ter a complete turn, 360 degree, turn, yeah. turn from the way you're living, turn from the way you're thinking, you repent, that's number one. And number two, be baptized. Oh, I don't have the time to preach this, but we're preaching next week. You got to repent and you got to be baptized. And then there's the promise. Number three, the promise. What is the promise? The Holy Spirit will come. The Holy Spirit is for everyone. But see, you got to repent and you got to be baptized in order to get the Holy Spirit. You ain't got to tarry. You ain't got to wait no eight days. You ain't got to have nobody be no one. You ain't got to go through that. You ain't got to go through that. The promise is the Holy Spirit is going to come. But you got to repent and then you got to be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what's the result of this message? The result is 3,000 souls saved. <clears throat> now you know this will be a mega church. They start off with a mega church with 3,000 souls. But see, we're not going to get about, we're going to get three chapters, Brother Mike, and five more thousand going to get saved. So within, so within a year's time, you got 10,000 members in this church being saved because of the word of God being preached. Yeah. Let's get the last point. Let's get the last point. So we can get out of here on time today. What was Peter's method? What's Peter's method? Peter's method is what we're trying to employ here at Unity of Faith. And we're trying to get everybody to attach to. Number one, biblical preaching got to be word centered. It got to be centered around the word of God. Amen. It's not centered around your needs. Amen. It's not centered around what you want. It's centered around something what God has already called us to do with this. And then biblical preaching got to be, it got to be Christ centered. Yeah, yeah. Let the church say amen. amen. Oh, if you really got somebody, just say amen. amen. If God speak to your heart again this morning, say amen. amen. Come on, give God some praise. Amen. I say, give God some praise. Amen. Give God some praise. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the biblical text. Thank God for Psalm 16. Thank God for David prophesied through, through that Jesus used him to prophesy the word. Amen. I wish somebody was excited about being myself. God is such a good God. He loves us so much. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. Amen. Church, say amen. Amen. amen.